All right, welcome everybody. You are at the Everett Rail Marshfield Public Library and tonight we're having spoken history. Our presenter tonight is Mr. Don Schnitzler. He's a local historian and he's going to be talking to us tonight about um, what is new in the new Marshfield Memories book. So there you go, Don. All right, thank you. Yep. All right, I'm going to try not to turn around and look at the screen, but I'm if it, if it doesn't move when, it, when you think it should, just let me know. All right, so about a year ago, we started planning activities for the Marshfield's 150th anniversary. And in those conversations came up the possibility of doing another pictorial book. And so in 2016, they put together the Marshfield Memories. And if you're not familiar with it, this is what it looks like. It's also included in the picture there. And basically, it is a collection of photographs that kind of capture little snapshots of Marshfield history. So there's an image and a caption that goes with it. And the idea was to do the same thing uh, for the 150th anniversary. 150th anniversary um, got, kept us really busy doing a lot of things. Even though we didn't have big events, we were always working on things. And one of the things we worked on was this Marshfield Memories book, too. Um, well, first thing we did after we called up for volunteers was we also put a call out for photographs. And I was, I was going to try to count up all of the photographs that we've collected over the years, that we've scanned, digitized, that we had to work with for this collection. I didn't have time. Um, I don't mean that uh, to be flippant or anything. We didn't have time because there are just so many pictures. People have been really good. Uh, organizations have been really good. And then uh, the Northwood County Historical Society has a collection of photograph negatives from the Marshfield News Herald, and we've been trying to convert those. I would estimate that what we had to work with putting this talk together, or putting this book together is probably close to 20,000 images. And so what we have to do is take that big mass of pictures and narrow it down to 200 plus or minus maybe 20, 25 images. And so there's been a lot going on during the course of the year, and this project was bigger than what we thought it was going to be. But it's getting close to being done. We've actually got some pages laid out. Uh, we know what images we're trying to look at and put into the book. We're just getting to the captions and things like that. So couple of uh, acknowledgements before we start. Uh, when we put out that call for volunteers, the first thing we did was we had a group of people that agreed to help us part, you know, prepare this book for publication. And the list of names is here, and I hope I didn't forget anyone, but Aaron Howard, Kim Krieger, Chris Leonard, uh, myself, uh, Angela Taves, Jaron Turner, Barb Weber, and Jen Witzel all pitched in to kind of help organize. And what they were doing, was they, they they had what they called the history club because we would meet once a week and go through pictures and sometimes there were very few pictures to go th through and other times there were boxes of pictures to go through and it was a it was a a lot of fun going through those images and seeing things uncovered that we didn't know a picture existed of and so some of those things will be in here thanks to the efforts of this quote unquote history club then we also put out this call for photographs and we had people bringing in images. Some people brought them here to the library and I scanned them here. Uh, some people took them to the Northwood County Historical Society. We scanned them there. And then when we had uh, in May, we had the memorabilia show at the Chestnut Center for the Arts and people brought photographs there for us to scan also. So altogether, we kept getting pictures. And in fact, the last pictures we got uh, right now, we're last Saturday. Someone brought a couple more pictures in for us to have to see if they would fit any of the categories that we were talking about. So we've had a lot of cooperation from the general public and then organizations. And, and that was a good feeling to know that we were getting all of those pictures and all those people involved. At the Northwood County Historical Society, we also had uh, a collection of negatives that were given to us uh, sometime 1997, 98, 99, uh, that goes back to 1940. 
of all the newspaper negatives. So the images that the Marshfield News Herald took to publish in their newspapers, they kept all of the negatives. And when they were getting ready to leave their office building on West Third Street, they gave them to us, uh, to the Northwood County Historical Society. Before they left town, there was another collection from 1997 until they left town that went to the Historic Preservation Association. So between the two locations, the HPA or the Northwood County Historical Society, most of the negatives that were used for publishing images in the Marshfield News Herald are still saved and exist here in town. And it creates a really good pictorial record for the community. And believe me, it's a lot of fun to go through those. And I'll show you some examples of those as we talk tonight. But when we called for volunteers, we also called for volunteers to help us scan those negatives. And if you look, there's a list here, Kibbe Arculari, uh, Sue Cull, Tim Krause, Kim Krieger again, Ryan Knack, uh, Serenity Paisley, Chris Porter, and his kids. Uh, and then myself have been scanning negatives and putting them into, uh, creating them or putting them into a digital format that we can open and access for publication of a book. So lots of images. When it comes to the books, the, the, the book, I've got a picture up here on the top of Marshfield Memories 1. That was published in 2016. And one of the things that's important to know is that first book, covered specifically the early years of the city of Marshfield, 1872 to 1940. There weren't any pictures after 1940 included in that book. And for this book, it's going to cover the years 1940 to 2000. So there's no overlap between the two books as far as the images that should be in there. So each one should be a unique standalone collection of images. Now, the first one, when you look at it, it's laid out in a landscape format, which is really kind of nice. Uh, the printer that we're, we're working with, though, doesn't do landscape. So the next book is going to be in a portrait format. It's going to look like a standard eight and a half by 11 book. And, and it will work just fine for what we're doing, but it'll be a little bit different looking. Uh, we have permission from the publisher of the first book, the Piedmont, Piedmont publishers to duplicate it so that they look like they're part of a set, but they will be different as far as the how they're formatted. Now, the reason I have the cover of the first book out is because it's already selected and published. We haven't sat down and selected the photo that will be on the front cover of the second Marshfield Memories book. And so that's coming and it'll probably be done in the next month, but we haven't had a chance to sit down and say, this is the photo we want. We want something that represents Marshfield, uh, but we want something that grabs attention, uh, evokes some type of emotional response to the picture. So I remember that, or I we did that. We did that when we were kids. And so we haven't figured out which picture it is, but we've got some good possibilities to look at. So the first book is 144 pages, approximately 200 images. I expect the second book will be approximately the same size and approximately the same number of images. But until we're done, we don't know exactly for sure. That's why it says it's still to be determined. And since the first Marshfield history book was published and then the second one, you can't put together a book without putting it together an index. And so it's not going to be a big index because there's short stories or short captions on every image, but it will be fully indexed so that people can look at it and find locations, businesses, people, places by name that are included in the book. And that will also kind of necessitate us taking a little time to create or generate that index as the pages are set up. Now, when you look at the table of contents, the first book, horizontal, the next book, vertical. Uh, so the old book is on the back and the new book is on the front. You'll see that there's some overlap in the content. You know, in the first book, they called it views and street scenes. Well, views and street scenes also is, seems to be encompassing what we're calling sights and sound in neighborhood and streets. And so one of the things that I wanted to kind of mention tonight as we get started is that as we're putting this book together, um, we have a number of pages that are set up already that I'm using for examples. But I will tell you that there's a good chance that the pictures that are on the same page tonight may not be on the same page in the book when it's done because 
the schools and sports overlap. You can kind of put some of the school, sports pictures from schools in with the sports pictures rather than the school pictures. Uh, the same thing is going to apply for you know uh, any of the sections. There are there is overlap. We have corner grocery stores and we have businesses. Well, a corner grocery store is a business. So we can try to put it into the section that's just corner grocery stores, but maybe it overlaps and fits better someplace else. We won't know that until we have all the pictures laid out, the captions written, and then we decide which page they really belong on. So I'm showing you examples tonight of what it's going to look like, but don't hold me to that. That is the absolute way it's going to look because it could change. So the important thing when you're talking about a book that has lots of images is, you know, what are those images going to look like? And so the first Marshfield memories, when you talk about the historical photographs that Marshfield had, um, the thing that comes to mind first is most of the images were taken professionally. The pictures are, the pictures weren't taken a lot by just every everybody on the street in Marshfield in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, and even early 1900s. They didn't have the equipment to take good pictures, but the people who did take pictures had good equipment and gave you really good quality images to use to duplicate and replicate in something like a Marshfield Memories book. Uh, when public contributed photos, and we put out a call for the first book to have people submit photos, when they submitted photos, they weren't submitting snapshots. They were submitting actual photographs that most often were taken by professional photographers that somehow ended up in the family collection. So when it comes to those first, the images in here, in this book, when you think about the quality of the images, you have really good, high quality images because of the way they were taken originally. And one of the differences when we talk about Marshfield Memories too is there are going to be public photographs that were submitted that uh, when you get to the, uh, the little Kodak 110 or 126 cameras, they didn't take as good a picture as a 35 millimeter camera. And so we have to be, we're looking at some of those really carefully. Is this really important to put in or can we get away with putting this in? And it might be that it's put in because of what's on the image, but we've been trying to make sure that the images we choose or select to put into this book are the best quality and best reproducible pictures that we can. And so there's a couple things that we're going to look at. Again, I mentioned the Marshfield News Herald negatives. One of the things that's nice about that collection of photos is it's the negatives. Negatives are always better when it comes to reproducing quality images. And so we'll have a lot of negatives from the Marshfield News Herald uh, that we will include in this book, but we'll also have uh, a lot of pictures that were submitted by either organizations or by individuals from the community. And, and so they're kind of comparable, but there may be a little difference in the quality in a couple of the pictures, but it's only because we needed that picture. And so you, I expect that you're still going to see mostly really good quality images. And I'll show you an example of a couple in a minute. Now, I mentioned that uh, the community has submitted photographs. The organizational photographs, we don't have a category, category called organizations, but some of the organizations in town have really been helpful. Uh, Marshfield Parks and Rec handed us boxes of photos that they had in their collection. It went back to Wildwood Park days in the 1930s and 40s. And so we had boxes of photographs to go through from different organizations. The Marshfield Public School District, I think it was seven boxes of photographs and files that we could go through to select pictures for. So lots of good pictures. Main Street Marshfield had totes. Uh, and they had lots of big totes of heavy pictures that we could go through and look at. So again, it was this, there's a lot of pictures that we've been sifting through, selecting to uh, choose for this book. And now we're at that stage where we're putting them on paper. 
And then again, I mentioned the Northwood County Historical Society and the Marshfield News Herald Negative Collection. And tonight I'm going to have a lot of images in here from the News Herald Collection only because I've been more actively involved with that. And I have those on my computer. And so it was easier to just snip those and put them into this talk tonight. But it, all the images will come from all the different sources. Uh, I, I should mention here, and I, because I don't want to forget, uh, when we started scanning the Marshfield News Herald negatives, we were given those negatives 25 years ago. There's no paperwork on it. So we went to the Marshfield News Herald and asked for permission to reproduce them, and they gave us that. Uh, this project would not be possible or would not be as all-encompassing if they hadn't given us that credit. So I just want to acknowledge their contribution uh, to this project because without it, it would be a completely different book. So, and I think people will enjoy looking at the photographs that uh, came out of the Marshfield News Herald. Now, when it comes to these images, we, we've had people doing different things at the Upham House. Uh, and the photo on the left uh, is Serenity Paisley. She's a, a student from the high school who comes in and volunteers to scan pictures for us. And our dining room table at the Upham House right now is set up with two scanners and boxes of negatives. And so in this image right here, there's a uh, box that's about 18 to 20 inches wide. Each envelope contains a packet of 50 to 60 negatives and they get laid out on the light plate, uh, sorted out by subject, then scanned and then assessed or given an accession number that matches the negative on the negative so that we can go back and look at it. Lots of little steps to get this done. Uh, this is 1982 and 83. Uh, the white paper here, those are the 1982s behind, no, 1982 is in front of it and 1983 is behind it. And so one box gives you two years. Some boxes have three years in them, but think 1940 to 1997, the number of boxes of negatives that we're going through to image so that we can use them for this book project. The message is that we are gonna be doing a book project this year. We are not gonna be through all the negatives. So potentially there could be other books down the road. And then when it comes to the number of images, I've got the sports collection, for example, there are every sport from water skiing to ice skating uh, in, in here, baseball, peewee baseball, uh, the varsity teams at the high school, the junior varsity teams, they're all in there in different sports categories. So there's potentially, you could do several books just on sports in Marshfield if you want. Uh, but there's lots of good images and after they're imaged and digitized, then we get to decide later what to do with them. Right now, we'll get a small sampling of all the different categories included in this new Marshfield Memories book. So Serenity is doing the scanning and accessioning of those photographs on the photograph on the left. On the right is one of the Northwood County Historical Society's board members, Tim Krause, and he's uh, assessing, accessioning photographs that were donated by the Central Wisconsin State Fair Office. They had a collection of photographs from there. Um, the, the, I would say that the years, the oldest pictures in there are probably from the early 1920s. Those won't make it into this book, but there were some old photographs in there or old, yeah, there were some old photographs in there. And then there was a lot more of them that were more current, 1960s, 70s, and 80s that were in there, oh, they're in the, and 2000 uh, that are in this collection. So one of the things that we've been doing with that is going through and finding out which pictures might be appropriate to use in something like this, something to document things that are going on at the Central Wisconsin State Fair, building a new barn, uh, youth hockey building, just whatever, trying to figure what's the best fit uh, for that. And there are lots of images there. In this photograph, Tim is assigning numbers to the images for the Northwood County Historical Society. So when someone sees a picture they like, they can say, I need to get a copy of that. For example, my grandfather's in it. Uh, if you have to go through 500 pictures to find one picture, there's no guarantee you will find it. So all the images will have a corresponding accession number so that if people want that image, 
a, a personal copy of that image, they could request it. So there are lots of steps involved in this process to make things uh, happen and work easily for after a while, after after wise, after, I can't talk all at once, so that we can retrieve the original negatives that we scanned to make them available to people or the original images that were scanned. So once we have all these images scanned and, and we're to the point where we're doing this image selection now, there's a couple things that we have to think about to do that. And the first one, the picture on the right is not a Marshfield photograph, but it's a, a really good example of an iconic photo. Uh, we look, we're looking for pictures that have good characteristics to them. The, the, the lighting is good. The composition is good. Uh, and again, that they will reproduce well in the book. We also want pictures that tell stories. And so as we look at this, we're going to try to show you examples of pictures that will jog memories about things we either grew up with or remember our parents telling us or, or some type, something that grabs you as the viewer to relay a story to you. Uh, pictures that have multiple people in them. Most of the time, the News Herald, when we use their negatives, were really good about identifying the photos. When people brought images to us, the first thing we said, can you identify the people in these images? And if you can identify them, would they object to or not object to us, including their photographs in the book? Because we're dealing with people at this time that might be living and some people may not want their images shared. And so for every picture that was submitted, we had a form that the donor or contributor uh, signed giving us permission to include it in the publication. Uh, and then one of the things that we kind of used as a filter right up front is uh, we wanted to have the original photographs rather than photocopies. Uh, people could walk in with an original photograph and go home with it right away. But um, the original photographs, photo, original photographs copy better, they reproduce better. And so we were really looking for um, originals to scan rather than photocopies. And so there were some copies or some images that were brought to the Northwood County Historical Society or here at the library that we didn't scan because they weren't original and who really has the copyright on those pictures. And so we wanted to kind of watch that again, because we're looking at current things. We wanted to make sure we weren't violating anyone's copyright when we put this book together. That's why we reached out to the Marshfield News Herald and got their permission. If we have pictures from Keel Studio, Lemire Studio, um, Clements, uh, or Clement, we are going to get permission before we include those in the book. And so it's just something that we had to kind of think about. And when it comes to the original versus a photocopy, sometimes you lose that ownership to know who really has the picture. And then the last thing for the image selection that was important is as we're looking at these pictures, because we don't want to duplicate things that were in the first book, is really maintaining that 1940 to 2000 so that there's no overlap with other images. You might get an image, for example, that has pretty school in it, but it, there'll be something different about it because it was taken at a different time. You know, they, they, it existed during the early years and this growing city time. Uh, but there will be different pictures. It won't be the same picture, which I think is important to keep in mind. Now, I mentioned the iconic picture. Uh, this picture on the right, you know, everybody associates it with uh, the Depression. Um, it's a migrant farmer, and, and she was working, and she was traveling ar along or around to, to find a job that she could work day jobs so that she could provide food for her children. And there's two kids in here, but I understand there were seven kids that she was trying to feed during the depression. And when you look at that picture, you can see that she's kind of staring out in space and wondering about what they were gonna do to survive. And, and I think there's pictures here in Marshfield that may not be as iconic to anyone else, but they still evoke some type of response when we see them. And so I'm going to show you a couple pictures from Marshfield and just talk about them. And I didn't take notes when I put this together, uh, so I will try to remember the dates. 
Uh, but these are three scenes that I think people will respond to. The one on the left, how many people grew up in Marshfield? Um, all right, just about everybody. Do you remember uh, eighth grade classes going down Central Avenue at Halloween time and painting the windows? Yeah, and when I was a student, I remember I was picked to paint the tree in the picture for St. John's School in 1960, must have been 1964, 65, when I was up at, up at St. John's. But the eighth grade students from all the grade schools were asked to design some photograph connected to UNICEF, and then they would spend a, a couple days working on Main Street, painting the picture. And just before Halloween, they were judged and somebody would get a prize. And I don't even remember what it was. But, but in this picture on the left, um, you can see three girls working on their submission for that uh, event. Now, one of the things is when you find the caption for this picture, it mentions that it's the eighth grade class of Sacred Heart School. You could tell by the plaid skirt because they had that color of uniform, or that plaid uniform. And over on the lower right-hand corner, they had signed their names on it. So you see Jay Herkert uh, of Abora, and then there was another name up above that she was standing in front of, so you couldn't make it out. I'm related to the Herkerts, though, so Jay Herkert. Right away, I think, oh, I can get hold of my cousin. So I send it to my cousin, Janet. And she said, why am I supposed to recognize this? And I said, well, Jay Herkert. And she looks at the picture. She, I send her the caption. She, I don't, I don't know anything about it. And she said, I bet it's Judy instead of this was, I was sending it to Janet. And Judy's my first cousin. Janet's my second cousin. And she sends it to Judy. And Judy says, yes. And she named everybody in the picture. There are pictures that we have been given that we don't have identification for, but to have the book of value, we really want to try to include as much identification as possible. So where we can, we're going to try to reach out to people and add that identification. And so in this one, um, I know that Patty Vibora is the, the, the girl that's standing with her back to us. Uh, and then there's a Kramer uh, on the other, on the ladder, I have it written down at home. I don't have it off the top of my head, but we will try to, whenever possible, to include identification of the individuals in the photographs. The picture in the center is Mad Market Days 1969. Now, remember Mad Market Days in Marshfield? Everybody, I, Mike's got a smile on his face there. Uh, Mad Market Days was something that everybody looked forward to. And if you look at this this image, I mean, you just see how many people are up and down Central Avenue shopping for bargains. 1969 was also a year, though, when Marshfield was undergoing some major construction on Central Avenue. And so what this picture doesn't show is that the other side of that is all ripped up so they can repave Central Avenue. So they had moved everything to the north side and they included sidewalk sales and the center of the road and had ponies, uh, a pony ride on top of it. Mad Market Days has lots of pictures tied to it, and there are things that you'd never think about being in Marshfield. And some of those images are in the process of being considered for this book. Uh, 1962, the, cra uh, the craze of the time was hula hooping. 1960, I think it was 1962, uh, um, Mad Market Days had a hula hoop contest. And there's a photograph of the contest or the judging uh, in Brain Park, not Brain Park, uh, Reese Field over on Oak Avenue, 200 Marshfield kids hula hooping in the baseball diamond area. That could, might, that might end up being the cover. You never know which picture is gonna make it, but there are all these really cool photos out there that exist that the Marshfield News Herald took. Then the last one on the right-hand side is a photograph um, looking south on Marsh, from Marshfield. And if you look, okay, you're on Highway 97. So you're on the south, you're on the north side of town, looking south toward the downtown. Uh, Mike, do you recognize this picture? Okay. All right. Radio station. If, if you look where the 97, the driveway is, that's just beyond that 97 sign, it probably goes to the WDLB radio station, station. And the photographer was standing on the corner from McMillan Street, looking south toward downtown Marshfield. Up on the top of the hill, um, I don't know if you can see it, but up on the top of the hill, 
way up there is St. Vincent de Paul. And then coming toward you, Beekler's Tavern is the building on the right-hand side. You see the telephone poles going down. That first building on the right is Beekler's Tavern. Across, across the road is the old Rolla Home Corporation. Leo Nikolai's insurance agent is agency. The driveway is sticking out next to that. There are all these little pictures that show what Marshfield looked like. They were taking pictures of the flower beds when they took these flower beds were just being planted. That was what the story was about, was the beautification of Central Avenue. But when you look at this, you just go down there now and look south from that intersection, how much the town has changed since that photograph was taken. And so that's one of the things that's going to be cool about this book. It's not things that our grandparents might have remembered. It's things that we can remember when we were kids or younger. And I think it's going to make it a much neater book and more enjoyable for people. And that's one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it's amazing, uh, all the pictures that they, all the history that they captured in their images. Now, one of the things about the News Herald photographs, and I'll just mention this now, is when they took pictures, they usually took three, four, five pictures of the same thing. So you have different angles of looking at images. And this is the one I selected because there's only one car in it. But there are other images that kind of, uh, one is looking uh, north, past the bowling alley instead of looking south toward Main Street or Central Avenue. So there's lots of different pictures that we can end up looking at. Now, because all of these had to do with streets, I put them in the street category. When we go to lay out the book, it could end up in the business category. It could end up in the school category. Can't tell you yet where exactly everything will end up in the book. And that's Chris Leonard is doing the layout and then we'll hash things out after she has a chance to do all of that. And then one of the categories had to do with Wildwood Park and other parks uh, in Marshfield. And so these three pictures I picked, uh, Wildwood Park is down in the lower right-hand corner. It's the old duck pond, the old monkey house, and one of the first small animal houses that were down there. And it's from about 1948 or 49, sometime in there. Uh, the picture above it is uh, part of the Hefco, or is the Hefco swimming pool. And I want to say it was 1954, but, uh, you know, we all grew up using Hefco pool probably. Probably, well, I won't, not everybody, but Mike and I went to the old Hefco pool yet, and then they changed it. Uh, but this is the original Hefco pool, and there's lots of images of Hefco pool. And some of the things that are cool about photographs of Hefco Pool is that they're taking pictures looking east. And so you see the businesses that were on the highway or on Rodas Avenue across the road, the old Horseshoe Cafe. There's a great picture in the, in the negatives of the Horseshoe Cafe that's really a photograph of Hefco Pool. But you look behind it and you capture all sorts of other things. And then the picture in the lower or the left hand side here is of one of the warming houses at one of the ice skating rinks in the 1950s. I think this one was 1951. It's the Oak Avenue warming house. And every ice skating rink in Marshfield had their own warming house. Uh, the guy that was in here that was kind of the, the, the caretaker of the warming house was Jay Kaufman. And you can see him standing right behind that stovepipe and then all the kids around there. I can't look at that picture and not smell wet hot mittens. Uh, that's the first thing that pops in my head. It was the oil heaters. Yeah, because they all had that same smell when you walked into them. And it's one of the pictures that'll probably end up in the book. We still got to kick it around as far as the pictures. But the point is that there are lots of good images of things that we will remember as opposed to things we might think we should know. And, and I think one of the distinctions here again is that this book will be more geared for our generation and, uh, and than it was for our grandparents. So now as far as the page layout goes, um, we, we started laying out the pages and this is, this is a section um, 
and again, as I said, it may not end up in this order, but these are two pages that are right now laid out to be side by side. And the pictures include three winter scenes. Uh, the upper left-hand image is uh, the five girls that were in part of a skating competition for what was called the Winter Frolic in 1951. Every year during Christmas holidays, the Marshfield Lions Association sponsored an, uh, sponsored an event called the Winter Frolic. And there were contests and each of the kids were entered into a different age category and they had skating competitions. And these are the winners for 1951 and it names all of them. And so it's kind of a cool picture. Uh, and then the caption came from directly from the News Herald. So the, at the time, uh, we assumed that it was correct. Uh, no offense to the news herald, but we all know that sometimes what you see in print isn't always correct. But but we're going to go with the assumption that all these things are right. Uh, and then uh, the picture across the page on the top is actually a slide that was on the Oak Avenue skating rink. And so I don't remember this particular slide ever when I was a kid. But kids would take their sleds, their toboggans, and use that for skating down onto the pond or the ice skating rink. The only thing that wasn't allowed, according to the caption, is they weren't allowed to wear their skates when they were doing that part. So, And then uh, the picture on the right is this little six-year-old kid, uh, Terry Hefko's son. Uh, there was supposed to be a race, and he started all by himself. And no one had the nerve to stop them. So there, there's a nice caption there. And again, the picture is identified. In the lower left-hand column, uh, when we first started uh, sharing images on the Marshfield and Northwood County History Facebook group, uh, one of the participants there asked if anybody remembered uh, a go-kart track. And at the time, I, I remember being there as a kid. I, rem I We have a whole movie of going around in circles there with some friends from Janesville, but I couldn't tell them where it was uh, or anything else about it. But here is a picture that appeared in the Marshfield News Herald in the 19, what was this, 1962, I think, uh, of that go-kart track. Uh, and actually, Marshfield in 1962 had a go-kart club. Howard Kraft had sold go-karts out at Kraft's Trading Center, and he put in the rink southeast of Marshfield, um, out near Kraft's Trading Place, that was used for a number of years. And the, when the first year that that track was put in place, from what I understand, Rolla Home had an event that they called Rolla Home Roundup. Rolla Home was a Marshfield builder uh, in the 50s and 60s, 70s. And they would bring in all their salesmen and have an event. The one year they took them out to the trout pond, which is out east of the high school uh, on the Central Wisconsin Sportsman's Club property. And then the next year they took them out to this go-kart track for a fun event to do while they were here learning about different sales techniques and things. So there's lots of pictures tied to Marshfield history that are buried in these negatives that are out there for the Marshfield, Marshfield News Herald. Now, one of the things after we start laying out the pages is then we have to look at the hard work becomes, it begins. We, instead of looking at the image just as far as, oh, this picture is cool, we have to start looking at ways of making it re better reproducibility. And so uh, the picture on the top is what was sent back to me as far as this is the picture and the page, how that would be laid out. Then I started manipulating the picture to see if there was a better way of reproducing it so that the resolution, the contrast, and everything was better when it goes to the print. Um, so that's going to be one task, is to make sure that the images that we're sharing are the best possible scans possible, as best scans possible. Uh, the reason being is as we're going through hundreds of negatives at a time, we are scanning them quickly and not really paying attention to dust in the background. It's really a matter of trying to identify the photo 
and get it scanned so we can say what, what it is and whether decide whether we want to use it for something. So the original images, the original negatives are all being filed back so we can still go back and rescan them if we need to. This was just manipulating. You can see the image can be made sharper just by manipulating uh, the image. And Mike is good at doing that, taking a, a picture that's not real good and using Photoshop and things to enhance the image of things. I know. I, 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 I'm not sure how. It, uh, I know. It's the same picture. I don't know how. Yeah. Chris must have taken the shadow out, but when I was doing it, I didn't go that far. Uh, and then the other thing is checking the caption for accuracy. Uh, we're going to, you know, kind of double check the spelling for places and names because places get places and names and even simple names can be misspelled. Uh, Steve Miller had a farm in one of the pictures and it mentions that this took place on the Steve J. Miller farm. But on the caption, it, it says the Steve J. Mill. And I know that's wrong. So we'll go back and verify that it's wrong and make sure it's right when the book is finally published. And as much as possible, we are going to try to identify the locations. Now, this picture, for example, is the Oak Street uh, ice skating rink. It was on the corner of Oak Street and West Third. If you're looking at this, the picture was taken looking north. The building behind uh, the middle skater is actually one of the army barracks that was put up to, to house soldiers after the World War II ended. There were lots of soldiers coming home and young families starting, and there were three army barracks there, whack barracks, that were put there for temporary housing. And then you can see the armory building on the left-hand side of, of the girl on the far left. So, so you can get a feel kind of for where it is and, and what it looked like then if you went back and looked at it today. And then there are some other pictures, and I, I just wanted to mention again uh, that there'll be a combination of pictures, either submitted pictures or from individuals or organizations or businesses, and then also things that uh, different time frames, but or different, same time frame but different angles of it. Uh, when I was a student at Marshfield Senior High School in the 19, late 1960s. Uh, in 1969, in the fall of the year, there was a Vietnam War protest. And this is actually a bunch of my classmates and Mike's <laughs> um, marching against the Viet war in Vietnam. And it's, it's, it's a different perspective or a different look at Marshfield than what you think about normally. On the right is a group of JCs uh, sending packages to the soldiers that were in Vietnam. And... Marshfield had a really active JCs organization, and they were involved in doing so many things. And it's nice to see these kind of pictures capture what people were doing on the home front for the soldiers at the time. And then Figgies over here, as we received pictures from different organizations or different people, we have to write those captions. And so right now, this one was placed here. It's just a reminder that we have to still write the caption for it. And we'll we'll use some of the history related to Figgy's Cheese uh, when they open business and things like that, trying to provide that caption. <clears throat> and then um, this picture, the two more pages uh, of the book. Uh, again, it's laid out, um, and they may not end up in this particular order. Dairy Fest Parade started in Marshfield in 1981. And this is from a few years later, and I don't see a year identifying the image right here, and I don't remember it off the top of my head. But that was the first year we had a big balloon in our parade. And so it's Clifford the Big Red Dog, and it was part of Marshfield's Dairy Fest Parade in sometime in the mid-1980s. 19... Some, sometime in the mid-1980s. I don't know the year for sure. So, And then the other two pictures... Um, on the right-hand side are Boy Scout activities or Cub Scout activities. One was they had kite flying on Oak Avenue. And so the picture on the lower right is a bunch of Cub Scouts uh, after a, a kite flying competition. And then they had the, what they called the push crate races on the hill on Fifth Street. And so I haven't gone back and really verified it, but I'm thinking this is about where 
Clarence Top lives. If you go a block and a half or so up Fifth Street, there's kind of a hill climbing up to where the um, where Wisconsin Avenue crosses. And I think that's about where this picture was taken. And in the 1950s, the kids had races down to Oak Avenue. So uh, the car, the car on the right actually won. So, and it also got a prize for the best looking. Now we talked about a lot of pictures that we have just to give you examples. Uh, if you've noticed in the last couple of weeks, there was another notice putting out or put out that said we still need corner grocery stores. One of the categories we were hoping to get bunch, a bunch of pictures for was corner grocery stores. And in my database, we have about 30 images that could be used, but they're not technically corner grocery stores. Marge Wolf stores in the upper right hand corner. That's a good example of a corner grocery store. And we have a couple of different examples of Wolf's Grocery Store. Uh, Schulte's Girls uh, on, on Central Avenue, Schulte's, Schulte, Schulte's, uh, Schulte's Grocery Store on the 300 block of West uh, North Central. Um, this is an image of it, but it's Bonnie's resale shop at the time. There's a number of local grocery stores. And what we were hoping to do was collect images where you could see that they were still grocery stores, whether it was the inside or the outside things related to that. And so we've got enough pictures to use if we have to, but if anyone ha still has photographs of grocery stores, we would really like to get a chance to scan those and include those in the book. Have you got one of, of my store? Uh, we've got, yeah, Weber's store. I've got one of Weber's store in here. Um, and that one would qualify in 1941 is when I think when it was built. And of course that sidewalk is open along there. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're trying to get, you know, flesh that category out yet a little bit. Uh, we have, like I said, we probably have enough that we can do it, but we wanted more of those small mom and pop stores, Weber's, Jergies. Uh, what? Marge Wolf is the, is the classic. She has to be in there. So. so anyway, anyone who has still has pictures of grocery stores, let us give us a holler. And then we have some unidentified pictures that we would love to be able to use. And this is just three of them, but we can't find where they appeared in the papers or who they are. And when the negatives were donated to the Historical Society, we think they were all in envelopes, but they are not all in envelopes now. And the envelopes that exist yet have the dates on them so you could find them in the newspaper. Um, this this guy cooking and it must it must be a roast beef or something uh is the you know inside of a kitchen of a restaurant in marshfield probably <laughs> wampler's name came up you know but I, we haven't matched it and we can't find it in the newspaper like him see that's i i didn't i don't remember the older generation there so this is why i think it's important to share pictures like that and i can try to track down Wamplers and see if there's somebody that could identify or verify it. Um, that's a good lead, but that's what we're trying to do. What? For, uh, oh, for the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, you're right. A lot of big dinners there. So we've got these pictures that we don't know where they're at. And we're still looking for a few of them that we'd like to include. And even if they don't get included in this book, it would be nice to know who they are because they're such classic pictures. The photograph up on the upper right hand side, the two guys on the bicycle, um, on the tandem bicycle, it was taken in, in it's the back of Columbia Park. And so the Columbia band shell is behind the guy in the front. St. John School is on the left hand side. And there's these two guys on this bike and it says they can pedal like heck, but can never catch up. And and if you look, the guy in the back's got a little pipe in his mouth and uh, this little tiny hat like he's in a clown costume. We've looked for clowns. We've looked for tandem bikes. We've tried to find what this image was because you look at it and you know there's a story connected to it. But without being able to uh, validate or identify what that story is, it doesn't have the same impact of putting it into a book. And so we're still looking. Wagner welding. Yep. 
<clears throat> we can't find it. We, we can find where they're renting tandem bikes. But every time we put tandem bike in, all we get is how much it is per hour uh, to rent them. So this is one we'd like to find. And then the lower picture, I'm. it is in with the Marshfield News Herald negatives. It's probably a homemade pontoon bicycle. Uh, and there's got to be a story somewhere with it. But again, it's one of those things. You look for pontoons, you look for water bike. Nothing seems to be showing up to give you the results on that so those are some of the examples of images yet that we're still trying to identify and there are lots of images that haven't been identified but these were things that we thought those would be cool to share in the book and so we're still looking for those and anybody have suggestions just let me know and i will follow up on wamplers and then we have someone just mentioned the hotel charles uh, this picture is another one of those pictures that sat there unidentified for a while. And again, Marshfield News Herald was really good at, at taking more than one image. And so there was this image outside the dining room uh, area with these two people sitting in it. And then there was a lineup of, lineup of people that were all dressed in flapper costumes or my father-in-law and mother-in-law belonged to a dance club. They had a dance club at the, at the Hotel Charles. And it was called what? I don't know. Uh, well, it turns out this particular picture, and it may not be the same one, was a group called the Friday Night Dance Club. It was formed in Marshfield in the 1930s, and it went on to exist until the 1970s. Uh, and this particular night, they were having um, a flappers dance at the Hotel Charles. And everybody came in costume. And you can see once you get to the picture and in the newspaper and identify it, can identify it, who these people are. This is uh, and the only reason I figured it out was I remember Mrs. Parkin, Mrs. John Parkin, who was a very nice, attractive lady. Uh, she just had she carried herself in a certain way. And I, in my mind, the first time I met her, she was kind of looking out like that. I thought that's got to be Mrs. Parkin. And so I looked for her. Uh, Kyle Parkin, and I couldn't turn it up. And then I changed the spelling of the name, and it popped up right away. And it's Dr. Jenny John that she's sitting with. And then on the other picture, there's a picture of her and John, um, this, uh, Clem Bining, uh, all the people that you would associate with the Hotel Charles and this particular time frame, John Stauber and John Stauber's wife. Uh, they were all part of this. office there in that house here in between Marsh, Main Street and uh, Vultures old radio station mm -hmm. right there. Him and his wife Marietta were very active in that. Dr. Drock and Irvin Drock and his wife Marietta were very active also in that. Well, I've got the identification. I'll have to look and see if that name is there. One of the things is that, you know, after you find them, then you can share them with know, knowing who they are and you know who to follow up with to get parts of the story. If, if this is the same dance club, I'd like to f see what I can find out, pick your brain to flesh out that story some more. Okay, all right. Well, this the, the, the presentation will be, is being recorded. It will be available on the library website after tomorrow, probably. Uh, for concluding here, what I wanted to do is say that as much as I would like to say exactly how much the book is going to cost tonight, I don't want to because I don't know how many pages it will be yet. And so I will tell you that we were shooting for $29.95, which is the same price that this book sold for. And if we have a pre-sale, we'll probably knock it down to $24.95 so people can pre-order it. The idea is that we will order enough copies ahead then to take care of the people that let us know in advance that they want copies and still print some others to have for sale. Uh, the important thing about this is it's it's been a work in progress for a year and it's going to take a few more months, but we're shooting to have it released by the summer of 2023. I would like to say by June dairy days, because we could have people stop at the upper mansion for the pie and ice cream social, have some pie and then pick up their book. And if that doesn't work, then we would do it for Hub City Days when we'll have people at the Upper Mansion to help pass out books then too. Uh, 
And the upper mansion is going to be closed for the next couple months because we're doing some re-wallpapering and restoration work to the library, parlor, and dining room and the bathroom. Uh, and so we would hope that people want to come back in May to see what what things ended up looking like. I'm on the board and I don't know for sure myself, but I'm looking forward to seeing it all spruced up because it deserves to be spruced up. With that, if any questions, anybody? There were lots of them. Um, you've got on, on 5th Street, there was one. 8th Street, there was one. There was one on Cleveland. Beekler's? I thought that was Jurgis. Well, it could be both, you know, because they changed names. Uh, and there was a Beekler's on, I thought, on what? East 8th? East, East yes. What was up? Uh, uh, my mind is going to. Habig's was up on uh, Blodgett. There was somebody else. Um, Arlington. Oh, there on Center, on Peach. There was one on the corner of Peach and. But yeah, there was Peach and Blodgett. There was also one on Peach and Fourth Street. Uh, the one across from the hospital was Durgies. There's there's a whole list of them. Uh, the ones I remember when I was a kid was Mrs. Blazinski, uh, Laverne Blazinski, and his wife, and then George Weber and his wife Anna had one down a little further. Um, and I, I know that there were there, there were all over on the south side of two. Town too, Thomas's uh, probably is a gross a corner grocery store, but it was a little bigger than a gross a corner grocery store. So there are lots of grocery stores in Marshfield, though, besides the big ones. And we have pictures of a lot of the big ones, which today aren't really that big. Parkway, Carrows, by comparison to what grocery stores look like today, they're still smaller. Weber's on your corner um, was a smaller grocery store. Than what you see when you go to Carol's or not Carol's um, festival or Walmart or or pick and save. When North and South Parkway opened up in town, we thought, oh my gosh, this is unreal. We're getting these two stores. It was big business. They were big stores then. Yes. Yeah. IGA, um, Kohler's, I mean, yes, yes. Those modern stores. So, But they look very small compared to what people have today. Anything, anything, anybody has questions? Chris. Any idea when you'll have your pre-sale information ready? Um, I'm hoping that we will get it done in this month yet. And then sometime during February, I, I deliberately didn't put a date in because Chris and I have to kind of connect and the, we get all these people together to do the proofreading and stuff. But I'm thinking that it'll be sometime during February by March for sure. It'll be announced in the Hub City Times. We'll put it on, a, on the Facebook page. We'll get the word out the best we can to let people know. And I think once people see it, because it's going to jog memories for a lot of people, uh, it will be a popular book. And it is, there's a mercenary reason for doing it this year. The Northwood County Historical Society depends on contributions and and to survive and this year the city had to cut the contribution that they usually give us and so this is one of the ways that we can bring in some revenue to help kind of replace that and what we don't need to replace the stipend the city gave us will go into an endowment fund for in the future so i'm on the board of directors yeah Everybody. Yeah. yeah, and the city has been very generous for a lot of years. I cannot say anything yes, yes, negative about it. They are between a rock and a hard place. And yeah. Mike, you and I were on the council. We probably would have had to make the same decision they did. So, so anyway, any other questions? Very nice. Oh, thank you. Well. We may not have a spoken history next 